All right. So take note that your, your, your company, your business can have different text types. So you must always make sure that you are compliant for each and every single text type at every point in time. Today, we are going to focus only on value at a text. We're going to talk about what is it, who is it for, what steps must you take to register for it, and once you are registered for it, what steps must you take to administer for it, when should it be paid, and how should it be paid. What is it? So value at a tax, commonly known as VET, is an indirect tax that has been charged on the consumption of goods and services in the economy. So the business will charge VET on supply of goods and services that it makes. So when you supply goods and services, you are going to charge VET on those services but there are certain conditions that one must meet. This one leg of VET is called output VET. Then the business, the same business, will also be entitled to deduct any VET charged to it. Meaning that you buy something from your supplier and your supplier has, has charged you VET on that supply, you are going to be entitled to, to claim VET on that purchase. This is the second leg of VET and it's called input VET. And as well, it is subject to certain uh, conditions. And for me, now, the business is required to pay the difference between VET charged by it and VET charged to it, or to claim a VET refund where VET charged to it exceeds the VET charged by it. We are going to have an example on the following slide. Currently in South Africa, VET is levied at 15%. Formerly, it was 14%. Now, who is it for? VET is compulsory to a person who may take some supplies of 1 million or in excess, or the person who expects to make taxable supplies of 1 million or excess in a period of 12 months. So if you are anticipating that you are going to have sales or you're going to sell items and your revenue is going to be either 1 million or more than 1 million in the next 12 months, then it is compulsory for you to register for VET. Alternatively, if your taxable supplies or if your sales or the services that you're going to render is not going to exceed 1 million, you can choose to voluntarily register for VET. But it also, there are certain conditions which you must meet. You, you must meet one of them being that at least you must believe that you are going to generate 50,000 or more within the next uh, 12 months. Once you register for VET, we call you a vendor. So the people who are registered for VET, we refer to them as VET vendors. On the following slide, I'm going to give you an example of the two legs of VET that we were talking about, output VET and input VET. Let us take an example of Lerato from Lerato Trading. Lerato is a VET vendor. Now VET vendor, it means she is registered for VET. The business that she does, she sells branded T-shirts. In this example, she's going to sell a branded T-shirt and the selling price is 100 rands. So as you might have seen on the invoices at the very bottom, we are going to have these three lines. The VET exclusive amount 
This is the 100 rand, which is Lerato's selling price. This is Lerato's revenue. Then the second line, Lerato, because she is a vet vendor, she must collect vet on behalf of SARS. So she's going to charge 15 rands extra, which is 15% more than 100 rands. So she's going to charge 15 rands to the client. Now it means the client must pay 115 rands and we call this a vet inclusive amount. So it's the vet exclusive, which is Lerato's 100 rands, is the 15 rand which Lerato will pay over to SARS. Then the total that the customer must pay to Lerato is 115 rands. We call this a vet inclusive amount. This is not Lerato's money. This is the money that uh, Lerato will pay over to SARS. So vet inclusive amount is the payable amount by a customer to Lerato. Lerato will take 100 rents and then 15 rents she has to pay it over to SARS. It is not Lerato's money. Okay. Then we call that 15 rents output vet, or also known as the vet on sales. Now, Lerato, she has where she buys her t shirts from. So she buys t shirts from another vet vendor. So it means where Lerato is buying a t shirt, they are also registered for vet. Now, Lerato buys plain t shirts for 80 rands. We are also going to have three lines. The vet exclusive, which is the 80 rands, uh, which is Lerato's expenses. Then we have 15% of that, which is 12 rands. This is payable by SARS to Lerato. And then we have the vet inclusive, which is 92 rands, which is payable by Lerato to the supplier. So when Lerato gets an invoice, the invoice will be saying 92 rents. And it's going to have those three uh, amounts, 80 vet exclusive, 12 vet amount, and 92 rents. Now, Lerato, because she is a, a registered vet vendor, she's going to claim the 12 rents back from SARS. Meaning that the person who was selling Lerato, this T-shirt, she collected the 12 rents and she paid it over to SARS. Then Lerato will go to SARS and claim back that money. We call this link input vet or vet on purchases. Then at the end of the period, and we are going to discuss different periods for vet in the future slides. At the end of the period, Lerato must do what we call a vet 201 report. So this is a report that she submits to SARS. It's, it's a report that shows the list of all the vet that she collected on the sales that she has made against the list of all the vet she has claimed on the purchases she has made. So we're going to take all the vet on the uh, sales, we add them together, that is output vet. Then we take all the vet we have claimed on the purchases that is vet input. Then the difference between the two will tell us if we owe SARS money or SARS owes us money. So in this case, Lerato collected 15 rents from the people she sold uh, the t-shirts to, and then she claims 12 rents from the people she purchased the blank t-shirts from. The difference is three rents, so it means she collected, I mean, it means she charged more than she claimed. So in this case, it means she must pay the balance of three rents to SARS. The opposite would have been if Lerato sold less than she purchased, then her vet input was going to be more than her vet output. And in that instance, we are going to say she has a vet refundable. That means SARS must pay uh, uh, the difference to Lerato. I hope that makes perfect sense. Right. 
Now, the next question that comes is, can I charge VAT on everything that I sell? No, we do not charge VAT on everything that we will ever sell. So to understand this, we have different types of supplies. So not all the supplies that you're going to make are going to, you are going to charge VAT on. So the supplies are grouped into three groups. Standard rated supplies, zero rated supplies, exempt rated supplies. Also, we can call it non-VET supplies. Standard rated supplies, if you are in the business of supplying standard rated supplies, you are going to charge VET on all the supplies that you are making. I have put a list uh, down there and the list is not exhaustive. Uh, you can check the VET 201 guide for a complete list. And I've highlighted uh, the examples that I want to make in red. Medical services other than by state hospitals. For example, when you go to a private hospital, the private hospital, they are supplying you with a standard rated supply. So they are going to charge you VET on that. Then zero rated supplies. For zero rated supplies, VET is charged at 0%. So here we are saying we still charge you that, but is charged at 0%. I will make an example after I explain exempt rated supply so that we can differentiate between the two. Exempt rated supply, no VAT is charged. Meaning that when you do the supply, you cannot charge VAT. An example of that is the supply of educational service. If you are in a business of rendering educational services, let's say you have a preschool or you have a school, you may not charge VAT on the uh, tuition fees that you charge to your, to your students, right? Now, the difference between the two is that for exam rated supplies, you, if you are in a business of rendering exam rated supplies, you are not going to charge VET when you sell. And you are also not going to claim VET when you buy. But for VET, uh, that is charged at 0%, that is zero rated supplies. You are not going to charge VET when you sell. But there are instances where you can claim VET when you buy. Let's take an example. Someone who sells a pill chart, a business or register, uh, canned, our regular canned uh, fish. When you sell the canned fish, you are going. You are not going to charge vet because it's zero percent. But because you are using the tin and you are using the paper, this is the material that you purchased. You are allowed to claim the vet that was charged on you on the input material like when you are buying paper and when you were uh, uh, buying that team. So you can claim input VET, but as you sell, you're not going to pay output VET. So I hope it makes uh, sense on the difference between exempt and zero rated supply. So for zero rated, you can claim input VET, you're not going to charge output VET. For exempt rated, do not claim output VET, do not claim input VET. All right. Then the second question is, can I claim that on all expenses that you can? Meaning that you can buy everything, can you buy everything and claim input VAT on everything? The answer is no. So input tax, I've put an example uh, on six items that you cannot uh, claim input VAT on, which on the surface to many people may look obvious, but it is not. Uh, number one, when you rent out or when you buy a new company, motor car or a double cab. So if you buy a car, you are not allowed to claim input VAT. And if you rent a car as well, you are not allowed to claim input VAT. Uh, and the reason for this is that if people were allowed to rent cars, 
and claim input VAT, then people were going to stop buying cars. But they were going to just rent cars so that they can always claim the input. So the sales of uh, motor cars were going to, 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 to go down. But as well here, it says you cannot claim when you buy a new motor car uh, or a double cab. This is because a double cab uh, is that bad Yemenly vaccine. Now, SARS regard this as a private vehicle. So this is what you would use for private uh, uh, purposes. So if people were allowed to claim VAT on this, then people were going to use their companies to buy their private cars. And by that, they're going to claim VAT. So this is why only motor cars and double cabs are not allowed. But if you are in a business of selling cars, you are allowed to claim uh, VAT input on the cars that you sell. And then also, um, your trucks and vehicles which are used for the business or which can be proven to be used for the business, you can claim that input on such a type of uh, vehicles. Number two, entertainment. You are not allowed to claim that input on entertainment. This includes the refreshment that you buy for your office uh, staff. When you take them out for, for lunches or you take your, your, your potential customers, for lunch, you are not allowed to claim VET input on this, including the year end parties and other functions. So those are not allowed to be claimed for uh, input VET. Purchases from non VET vendors. So when you buy from someone who is not a VET vendor, you cannot claim VET because you are not charged VET by that person. No claim on paychecks. Salaries, wages, and allowances don't contain VAT, so you cannot claim a deduction for the amounts that you pay to your employees. Letting a whole, uh, so in a previous example, when you go on the list of the VAT exam supplies, you will see that uh, residential accommodation is vet exempt. So if you let out a home, uh, I'll, I'll give an example. Let's say you have a business in, 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 in Cape Town and you send your employees in Cape Town uh, to, to, to work there. Then you have a house in Cape Town. Then you say to your employees, you can stay in the house. Then you are saying uh, the rentals, that the employees uh, must pay is going to be the cost of the company, right? So when you send an invoice to your company from your private uh, uh, place of stay, your company will not be able or will not be allowed to claim that on that because this is a residential accommodation. As well, it means if you're in a business of letting out uh, the bedroom. If you wanted to register for VET, you are not allowed because the service that you are providing is very exempt. And then number six, no invoice, no claim. So you cannot claim VET on any supply which you have made, which you did not use, which, which you did not issue a valid tax invoice. I will touch on the requirements of a valid checks invoice in the next slide because this is where most of our clients struggle as well. All right, so a valid tax invoice. So without a proper tax invoice, a business cannot claim input tax on business expenses. All right, I have listed the requirements for a valid uh, tax invoice. So when you become a vet vendor, you do not send an invoice that looks like any other uh, businesses. There is a way in which your invoice must be made out to look like, and it must contain the list uh, of the following requirements, which I'm not going to read out because of time, but please make sure that you request a copy of this presentation 
so that you can go through that list. And when you are a, a vet vendor, make sure that your tax invoice, it contains all uh, the information that is required there. If it does not contain this information, uh, should there be an audit on you made by SARS? Uh, all the input taxes that you could have claimed at the time, they will be null, they will be invalid because SARS will say you did not issue, uh, you, you, you did not get issued uh, a tax, uh, a valid tax invoice. So it's also necessary that and important that whoever that you buy from, when you are a vet vendor, make sure that they send an invoice that meets this requirement. Because if they send you an invoice that does not meet this requirement, it makes that invoice to be an invalid tax invoice. So you cannot claim VET on an invalid tax invoice. Please take note of that. When should I submit VET returns? And when and how will I make payments? All right, so a company must submit its VET 201 returns by monthly, semi-annually or annually. So the difference between these terms it's just uh, in the amount of revenue. For companies which generate less than 30 million a year, they must submit their tax return every two months. That means bi-monthly. So in the case of Lerato, we would work, we would work out the vet on sales and vet on purchases for two months. Then at the end of two months, we have to submit the VET 201 report to SARS. All right. And I will make an illustration or an example here. So a vendor is required to submit VET returns and make payments uh, on or before the 25th day or the last business day of the month, following the month in which the VET vendor's tax period ends. I will make an example. Let's say, um, SARS gives you uh, the even period, we call it even period. So this will be two months ending in February, two months ending in April, which is period 2022-04, period ending in June, which is 2022-06, period ending in August, which is 2022-08, and period ending in October, which is 2022-10, then period ending in December, which is 2022-12. So what this means, if you are on odd, uh, sorry, on even periods, it means your two months will be January, February, we call it period two. The next period will be March, April, which is period four. Next period will be May, June, which is period six. So you will see there that the last month on the period will be 02. So we will call the number by the last month on the period. Now, when it comes to filing, if you your period is January to February, you are going to have to file by the 25th of March. So March is the month that comes after February. So we are going to give you until the 25th of the month following the month where your period ends. If your period ends in April 2022, the month that comes after April is May. So you are giving until the 25th of May to file for your period four. So we will always, or SARS, SARS will always give you a, a period of 25 days after your period ends to prepare your tax return, uh, which is VET in this case, and to file your VET tax return. All right, I'm going to talk about the advantages of registering for VET. So what are the advantages of registering for VET? Number one, enforcement to keep accounting records in order. So because SARS requires you to file returns every second month and you want to submit the figures which are correct. 
This forces a business person to always keep their accounting records in order. So this is an advantage because in the long run, when your accounting records are in order, it helps you to make decisions which are informed. Number two, preferred by big buyers. Now, if your customers are corporates who are VET registered, registering for VET will help you because when companies make bigger purchases, they also want to claim input VET. So if you are registered as a VET vendor, every big corporate that buys from you, they are able to claim back uh, the VET portion of that purchase. So this puts you in a, at an advantage over uh, suppliers who are non-VET vendors. Number three, it helps in reduction in costs. Because if you are a VET vendor, you are allowed to claim back uh, the input VET on the purchases. So this can help uh, you to lower the amount by the, by the VET amount. Remember the example of Lerato, where the T-shirt was 92 rands, but because she is vet, uh, she's a vet vendor, she's going to be able to claim the 12 rands back from SARS. So essentially it means she only spent 80 rands to obtain that uh, blank T-shirt. But for everything as we know, we can have advantages, but they are also going to be disadvantages. And what are the disadvantages of registering for VET? Because a lot of people, they just look at one uh, advantage, which is being able to attract big customers. Then they register because of that reason, but they don't look at the disadvantages. What is it that they can disadvantage one from registering for VET? Number one, accrual basis of VET. Accrual basis is a system of accounting where we say that a person becomes liable to pay VET at the point when they issue the invoice, as opposed to the cash basis, where you become liable only when you receive the money. So VET is administered on a cruel basis system, meaning that if you sell one T-shirt as Lerato, Okay, the, meet, the meeting will end in, in, in 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, um, I'm hoping we will be done. But if not, then I will, I will just give you maybe 10 more minutes, then we wrap up. But please make sure that you, you type out your questions so that my team can have a list of them. And then, um, as you type out a question, make sure that you put your, your email address so that uh, your email address and your, and, your, and your number so that when we answer, then we can, we can send you uh, to, your, to your email address or to your, to your WhatsApp. Because of time, um, we, we will not be able to, to cover every, everything, but we are almost towards the end. All right. Um, so this is a, this, this is a, a disadvantage. When Lerato sells that T-shirt for 115 rents, the time she makes that sale, she already owes SARS 15 rents, irrespective of whether the client has paid the, the 115 or not. She is liable to pay SARS the 15 rents. Now, this can impact all Lerato's cash flow. Because if she does not collect, she still has to pay sales 15 rents, which she has not collected. So this can severely affect your cash flow, especially if you are uh, a big business or you have made uh, uh, big sales. Disadvantage number two is the price increase. Now, if your customers are consumers, meaning these are not corporates who we know when they buy from, they can claim for from sales. If you sell to end users, remember, they are not vet registered, so they are not going to be uh, able to claim for, for the vet. So the 15%, it means that your products or your services are going to be 15% more expensive. 
than if they were buying from someone who is not vet registered. So say, for example, uh, Lerato sell the t-shirt for 115 rands, and then another person who is not vet registered, they're not going to sell for 115 rands. They're going to sell at that selling price of 100 rands. So it means Lerato's price will be 15 rands more expensive. So this puts Lerato at a disadvantage. So before you register for vet, always ask yourself, who is my target customer? Am I going to sell to big corporate who are vet registered? Or am I going to sell to end consumers who are not vet registered? If you are going to sell to uh, end users who are not vet registered, it is not advisable that you register for vet unless it is compulsory. It is not advisable to voluntarily register for it because it is only going to increase your prices. Number three, administration time and co uh, and, 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 and costing uh, consuming. So as we have already, I, I, I believe at this point in time, most of you already lost about what you're talking about. So it just proves that uh, that is not an easy uh, text type to deal with. So it will need administration, uh, which can be time consuming. And also because you are in the business of branding t-shirts. You did not go to school to study accounting or to study taxes. You might have to hire uh, either an in-house accountant or you might employ an external company to do this, this tax for you. So this Inza. can what it can consume uh, your time and it can also eat on your costs as well to hire someone to administer this on your behalf. This is a disadvantage. Non cost opportunities. Remember, you must always be compliant so that you become attractive to your suppliers and you become attractive to your customers. If you miss uh, compliance because of this vet type, then it can cost you opportunities. For example, your CSD will say you are not compliant. Big companies, when they go on your CSD, they are not going to offer you job opportunities. So. Go through these disadvantages, then before you register for VET, make sure that you are satisfied with, with all of them. How do I deregister for VET? All right, I'm not going to spend enough time on this because um, maybe many of you are not even registered for VET. But if you are registered for VET and you are realizing now that the advantages of you remaining registered are more. Uh, so the disadvantages are more than the advantages of you remaining registered. How can you deregister? So number one, if you no longer meet the requirements, let's say you are no longer now generating more than a million, then you may choose to, to deregister. And then if you cease to carry on an enterprise, let's say you close your business, then you can also deregister. Um, all right. The, list of uh, the requirements are stated there. You need to complete a form that we call VET 123E, which you can obtain from SARS. And then also there are a list of other requirements which you have to uh, uh, meet before you can uh, deregister. And remember, deregistration does not now uh, absorb or remove you from the obligation of paying uh, the previous uh, vet uh, obligations which you have uh, been incurring, meaning that if you are owing SARS and you choose to deregister now, it doesn't mean that whatever that happened uh, in the past now is, is now removed. It still uh, remains. So the vet payable on deregistration has to be paid uh, to SARS within six months of deregistration. And I will emphasize as well, the process of deregistration can be costly uh, as well. So always make sure that you use the services of someone who is knowledgeable about the VET Act, who can advise you uh, better on this process. And then failure to submit a return or late uh, submission. So this is a generic and it applies to all the text types. So if you do not submit your text return, let's say you are a VET vendor, but you don't submit your text return, SARS imposes on you what we call an admin penalty. 
that mean penalty can range from 250 rands to 16,000 a month for each month that you are not complying on. So let's say they charge you 250. The minute they start imposing those uh, penalties is going to be 250 every month until you, 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 you file your, your, your return. So it's going to incur like that. In 10 months, you can hit 2,500. That's a lot of money. And also, let's say now you submit your tax return, but you submit it late. SARS also imposes a late uh, submission penalty, and this is 10% on the debt amount. Say now you were supposed to file 23,000 uh, by the 25th of the month, but you don't submit by the 25th, you submit two days later on the 27th. Then you are going to be charged 10% of that, that is 2,300. Meaning that you will owe SARS 23,000 plus 2,300 on, 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 on late uh, penalty. And SARS also imposes uh, interest on penalty. So let's say you don't pay your penalty, they're going to impose uh, interest on that late penalty. All right, and tax compliance status, we spoke about this on our previous uh, webinar, which you can follow to learn more about how to become tax compliant and minimizing tax uh, liability. So we have tax avoidance and tax evasion. We have spoke about this as well on our previous webinar. So for the sake of time, I will skip this as well. So we have come to the end of our, of our meeting and the following uh, contact details, as we've already spoken at the beginning of the meeting can be used to contact, to contact us. Those are our numbers and that is our office address. So you can visit us um, at an appointment. And everyone who has asked questions, we're going to take these questions and I will um, answer them uh, privately. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Now wish you all the best in your, Is there one? In your business uh, activities. Thank you. That's the one. I love the same. <laughs>